Vitamin B12 plays several critical roles in cognitive function. These include energy production, DNA and RNA synthesis and repair, genomic and non-genomic methylation, and the production of numerous neurochemicals and signaling molecules that are critical for our mental health and the function of our brains. Sadly, many people are not getting enough of this essential nutrient, and this increases the risk of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and other neurodegenerative conditions. In this video, I'm gonna cover recent research on B12 and cognitive health, and give you some practical tips for optimizing your intake of B12 so you can protect your brain function as you age. Let's dive in. So I'm gonna start with a 2022 study published in the journal Nutrients. This was called Influences of B12 Supplementation on Cognition and Homocysteine in Patients with Vitamin B12 Deficiency and Cognitive Impairment. So these researchers found that correcting B12 deficiency in people who already have dementia led to an improvement in cognitive function. The patients with dementia and B12 deficiency were given 1,500 micrograms of methylcobalamin, which is a form of B12 that you can take orally or sublingually. And within 60 days, they saw a significant improvement in cognitive function. Average B12 levels in the study increased from 183, which is pretty severely deficient, to 977, which is uh, totally normal. The next study was a two-year placebo-controlled randomized trial. It was published in Geriatric Psychiatry. It was called Cognitive and Clinical Outcomes of Homocysteine-Lowering B Vitamin Treatment and Mild Cognitive Impairment. And this was in people who are over 70 who have mild cognitive impairment. They found that supplementing with B vitamins, including B12, slowed cognitive decline, especially in people with homocysteine levels above 11. So why would that be? Homocysteine is a sticky inflammatory protein that requires B12 and folate and B6 to be converted back into methionine, which is a, an amino acid and one that is generally beneficial. When homocysteine levels climb above 11, it's often a sign that we don't have enough B12 or folate because, as I mentioned, those nutrients are required to convert homocysteine back into methionine. So homocysteine is often used as a more sensitive marker for B12 deficiency, and that explains why patients in this study with homocysteine levels above 11, who thus had B12 deficiency, were more likely to benefit from B12 supplementation. And finally, let's look at a similar study um, that was published in the journal PNAS, and it was called Preventing Alzheimer's Disease Related Gray Matter Atrophy by B Vitamin Treatment. So they used a similar combination of B vitamins in this study as in the last one I talked about, and they found reduced shrinkage in regions of the brain commonly affected by Alzheimer's disease. Now again, the benefit was found in only people who had homocysteine levels above 11, which is to say that uh, this benefit was found in people who had B12 deficiency, but this represented 50% of the participants in the study. And it was not a small effect. The shrinkage was reduced by eightfold compared to those who were taking placebo. Now, collectively, these studies show the importance of maintaining normal B12 levels as we age, but unfortunately, many people don't do this and rates of B12 deficiency are significantly higher in the elderly than they are in younger adults. Now, there are several reasons that this is the case. One is that as we age, our stomach acid production tends to decline, and with decreased stomach acid production, we are less able to absorb B12 that we get from food or supplements. Uh, also, as we age, we're more likely to have various kinds of chronic diseases that impair B12 absorption and drugs like metformin, which is a drug that's prescribed for type 2 diabetes, uh, which is common in, uh, as people age, also interferes with the absorption of B12. So another issue with B12 is that most studies that look at B12 deficiency use serum B12 as a marker and they use a cutoff of 200 or 220 picograms per milliliter for deficiency. Now this is problematic for a few reasons. Number one, studies have clearly shown 
uh, pretty significant effects of B12 deficiency occurring at levels between 200 and 400 picograms per milliliter. So even though the lab range goes down to 200 or 220, uh, people can definitely be experiencing symptoms of B12 deficiency at higher levels of say 250, 300, 350, or even 400. The other issue is that serum B12 is just not a very sensitive marker for, B, for B12 deficiency. B12 deficiency occurs in four stages uh, and progresses you know, from less severe to more severe. Serum B12 is, can only detect the fourth and final stage of B12 deficiency. Homocysteine, which we talked about earlier, and another marker called methylmalonic acid can detect stage two and three B12 deficiency. And holotranscobalamin or holotc is the only marker that I'm aware of that can detect stage one deficiency, but it's not widely available in the US. So this means it's crucial to get enough B12 either from food or supplements or both. And the best food sources of B12 are organ meats like liver and kidney, shellfish like clams and oysters, and beef, eggs, and cheese. A common myth among vegetarians and vegans is that it's possible to get B12 from plant sources like spirulina, soy, and brewer's yeast. But plant foods that are said to contain B12 actually contain B12 analogs called cobamides that block the intake of and increase the need for true B12. Now, supplementation can also be helpful and even necessary if you're not eating a substantial amount of the foods that I just mentioned, and or if you have digestive issues, low stomach acid, if you're taking a medication that interferes with B12 absorption like metformin, or you, you have other health problems. When you're supplementing, make sure to take the active forms of B12 like methylcobalamin, adenosylcobalamin, and to a lesser extent hydroxycobalamin, rather than cyanocobalamin, which is a synthetic inactive form. Now, in theory, we can convert cyanocobalamin into those more active forms, but that conversion is not always efficient. So just keep that in mind, and I hope this video was helpful. If you want to learn more about B12, I put a link to a free ebook. Um, on B12 I have on my website in the description of this video and I will see you next time.